<clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you'll forgive me, I uh, have a cold, and so my voice may be joining us and leaving us at various points uh, over the next uh, 30 minutes. Uh, first, I want to begin by expressing my thanks to the World Federation and Dignity SA, and in particular, Professor Sean Davidson and Lee Last for uh, inviting me here to speak. It uh, is a privilege uh, to speak and learn from you all here today. Uh, there are occasions, as Gwendolyn remarked, in the importance of being honest when it becomes more than a du moral duty to speak uh, for cause or to speak one's mind. Uh, sometimes it is a pleasure, and this is one such occasion. Uh, for the many who believed that the Constitution affords individuals the right to determine their time and manner of death, the decision in Strandstrom Ford by a Supreme Court of Appeal two years ago uh, was a setback. For me as an academic and a lawyer who grew up witnessing the powerful impact that our Constitution has in protecting the liberties of individuals and creating a more just society, I was disappointed. Truth be told, I considered the case an easy one. It seems to me that our Constitution had uh, to answer a more difficult question over the 24 years of our democracy. These include where the pregnant women with HIV and AIDS have the right to ARVs at the state's expense, whether the right to housing means that the state is compelled to embark on programs that make housing realizable for the poor and the marginalized, and whether the homeless may be evicted uh, without the state finding alternative accommodation. It is no surprise that our Constitution is lauded as being the most progressive in the world. It has transformed our society in ways unimaginable 24 years ago. So you'll forgive me for my naivety in thinking that the outcome of Strangham Ford was a foregone conclusion. It certainly wasn't for Mr. Justice Malcolm Wallace, who wrote the opinion of the court in this case. I should state at the outset that the decision does not make a finding as to whether assisted dying uh, is permitted in South Africa or should not be permitted in South Africa, but one cannot help draw inferences from the judgment that it was written to discourage future, future litigation on the subject, that it was a note of caution to other courts who may hear the matter again, and that the judge himself believed that it should not be permitted in our law. I will speak about these points in turn. I want to tell you why this is not the case and why I believe the Constitution answers this question very clearly for us. My remarks will address many of the fault lines that exist in Justice Wallace's decision in Strangham Ford, but I will also draw upon more than a quarter of a century of our constitutional court's jurisprudence on uh, various rights. In doing this, I hope to answer two of the hardest questions that any future litigation on the subject will have to answer. And the first is why the Constitution demands the development of our law in this area. And the second is why the interests of the state do not outweigh those rights violated. I propose to answer these questions uh, by beginning with the discussion looking at four important protected rights. For the sake of time, I won't go into all of them in enormous detail, but I'm more than happy to answer questions and scan over them later on. The first is the right to life, the second is the right to dignity, the third is the right to equality, and finally the right to freedom and security of the person. I will then turn to my second point, which focuses on even if these rights are violated, are the interests of the state such that it mandates protecting the interests of the state over the rights, uh, over the claims uh, of those rights that are violated? So to begin with, the prohibition on assisted dying is not sourced in any piece of legislation. It comes from our unwritten law, the common law. And it is our common law that prohibits aiding and abetting another in bringing about the end of their life. In short, South African law, like many other countries, does not recognize consent as a lawful defense to murder. South African law treats physician-assisted euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide as the same for purposes of our criminal law. The legal consequences that attach to both are murder, and the law does not regard them as two distinct acts with two distinct legal implications. Before Strangham Ford case uh, made its way to the Supreme Court of Appeal, Judge Fabricius in the North Gauteng High Court made the argument that PAS might be protected under our law on the authority of Grot John and other cases. 
I wish to say a few things about this case before commencing with my constitutional analysis. I do this because I know that there are lawyers in this room who think PAS might be permitted in our law. I want to tell you why this is not the case and why pursuing a different legal argument is more important and why there are better legal arguments to be made. Grotjohn was a case which arose out of an unhappy marriage. Mrs. Grotjohn was partially paralyzed and bipolar, and Mr. Grotjohn was having an affair. After a heated argument one evening, Mrs. Grotjohn claimed that a rifle owned by her husband was not in working order. He collected the rifle from his possessions, made a few adjustments to it, and showed her that it was in working order. Another argument then ensued, and Mrs. Grotjohn then threatened to kill herself. At this point, Mr. Grotjohn loaded the gun, handed it to her, and uttered the words to the effect, shoot yourself, you are a burden to me. Mrs. Grotjohn shot and killed herself. The question before the trial court was whether the actions of Mr. Grotjohn were independent or so independent uh, uh, of Mrs. Grotjohn's suicide that it could be said to have broken the chain in causation. The trial court held that the actions of Mrs. Grotjohn formed an independent and distinct action that severed the chain in liability that would render Mr. Grotjohn liable. Some, including Judge Fabricius, used this authority to argue that PAS is not prohibited in our law because a doctor who gives a patient lethal medicine, which might bring about the patient's death, commits an independent act that breaks the chain in causation. The argument is not entirely correct. When the then Minister of Justice brought an application to the Appellate Division, now our Supreme Court of Appeal, he asked whether the act of aiding and encouraging a suicide is a crime under South African law, having regard to the decision of Grot John. It is here that Chief Justice Stain set out the principles in our law. Stain argued that not every independent act breaks the chain of causation. He argued that if someone provides the means to another which brings about the end of their life, that, uh, they are guilty of murder. Stain did not pass judgment on Grot John, principally because it wasn't a question before him, but it is clear from the application of law set out by Stain in Grot John that, there was, that the trial court's decision was incorrect. And these sentiments are, uh, are shared by Justice Wallace in paragraph 52 of Strangham Ford. So, it is clear that the common law prohibits both PAS and PAE, and I want to tell you why there's need for development. Development, which is mandated by our highest law, the Constitution. In particular, Section 39.2 of the Constitution, which is a unique feature of South Africa's Constitution. No Constitution in the world has a clause like it. It is a clause which obligates our courts to bring our common law in line with the Constitution. And where the common law deviates from a right or value in our Bill of Rights, it must be developed so that it is compatible with our Bill of Rights. And in the case of a sister dying, our Constitution requires the common law uh, to be brought in line with the constitutional rights to life, dignity, equality, freedom, and security of the person. I begin with the right to life. Interestingly, in the Strangham Ford decision, Justice Wallace ponders on the qualities of life. He draws inspiration from many courts around the world, including Canada, the United States, the European Court of Human Rights, Ireland, uh, to name a few and he unpacks these rights. He finds that the majority of foreign courts have not found the right to life to include the right to die, and he cites authority to that effect. It is perhaps curious why the learned judge did not have recourse to our own law and jurisprudence on the subject of the right to life. And he has omitted perhaps the most important decision in South African constitutional law on the right to life, the decision in S versus Makwanyane which struck down the death penalty. The right to life is a foundational right in South Africa. It is a simple clause in our constitution, but a powerful one. It proclaims in very simple language, everyone has the right to life. Nothing more and, and nothing less. It does not qualify the right like many other constitutions. It does not mention the deprivation of the right must be in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice as other constitutions and international instruments do. What could be more important in a country like South Africa? Our history shows contempt for the right to life, one where the state could, in cold blood, extinguish the life of its citizens. 
So when Chief Justice Chaskelson, then President Chaskelson of the Constitutional Court, said in S versus Makwanyane that the right to life and dignity are the most important of all human rights and the foundation of all other rights, he was making a profound statement about the limitations of state power on these rights. These rights are rights which the state is not entitled to, to, to traverse. And from this, there are obligations on the state that arise out of the right to life. In Makwanyane, Chaskelson recognized that the right to life creates obligations on the state. And one obligation on the state is to protect the life of its citizens from threatening attacks. The state must do all it can to preserve the life of its citizens. Now, there is no doubt this argument will be made by those who oppose assisted dying. They will argue that the jurisprudence of the courts tell us that the state is required to protect the life of its citizens and law permitting assisted dying is an affront to that injunction. That is not the full story. Um, how much time do I have left? Thanks. That is not the full story. First, because our constitutional court itself heard this argument before in relation to the death penalty. It was argued in, argued in Makwanyane that the death penalty acts as a measure which ensures the protection of the right to life of South Africa's citizens because of the deterrent it creates. The court rejected this argument because it proclaimed that even if the state's argument was correct, that it is an effective deterrent, it cannot contravene the right to be free from cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, something which the death penalty affronts and something which the prohibition on assisted dying affronts too. I will turn to this shortly. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, in order to under, understand the extent of the state's obligations under the right to life, to preserve life, you have to understand what life means. I want to unpack this notion because it is here, I believe, that those who oppose assisted dying are, are deeply misguided. It is also the reason why Justice Wallace was misguided in his exposition of the right to life in Strangham Ford. To understand what the right to life means, you have to understand what Justice Chaskelson meant when he said the rights to life and dignity are the foundation of all rights. He means that the right to life cannot be divorced from the notion of dignity. It is dignity which informs life, and it is the right to life which informs the value of dignity. Both exist to complement each other. They cannot be divorced from one another. On this understanding, an understanding profoundly express, expressed by Justice O'Regan in the same opinion, the right to life means more than just the right to exist. It means the right to a life which individuals find meaning. And it means the right to a dignified life. Earlier, Professor Landman said that we should be able to waive this right. I want to tell you why we don't need to do that. And the answer is seated in Justice O'Regan's exposition of this right. She tells us in Makwanyane, the right to life in one sense, and I quote, is antecedent to all other rights in the Constitution. Without life, in the sense of existence, it would not be possible to exercise or to be the bearer of other rights. But the right to life was included in the Constitution, not simply to enshrine existence. I repeat, not simply to enshrine existence. It is not life as mere organic matter that the Constitution cherishes, but the right to human life, the right to a life of hum to live with human dignity, to be a part of the broader community, to share in the experience of humanity. The concept of human life is at the center of our constitutional values. The Constitution seeks to establish a society where each individual member uh, is recognized and treasured. And so understanding this notion of the right to life means that life isn't just the right to exist. And so opponents who claim that the right to life is uh, a bulwark against assisted dying, we say no, the clear jurisprudence of our court tell us otherwise. And this sentiment was confirmed by the Constitutional Court in the case of Subramani uh, and Causa. Because of time, I want to move to other rights uh, so that I can deal with two very difficult arguments. And that relates to the right to dignity. The sentiments of Justice Wallace uh, asks us to consider the values and cult of cultural and religious groups before deciding whether dignity is violated. This view is wrong. The right to make individual choices about the manner and time of one's death and the dignity in that decision is not subject to the views and values of others. 
Justice Wallace's understanding of dignity treats human beings as instruments in the service of others' values and others' views. This view is profoundly at odds with our jurisprudence on the right to dignity. Rights exist or they do not. They are not conditional upon the consent of the majority or of select groups. It is the very purpose of a Bill of Rights to act as a bulwark against majority rule. This is what it means to have a constitutional democracy. It is for this very reason that we abolished parliamentary sovereignty and replaced it with constitutional supremacy, uh, as was so saliently observed by Chief Justice Chaskelson in Makwanyane. Justice Wallace would have done well to consider this. And the reason why is because to Justice Wallace, dignity is conditional upon the views and values of others. The almost quarter of a, uh, of, of a century of jurisprudence by our constitutional court tells us that the right to dignity means uh, the right to make decisions about yourself and your individual autonomy and to live a life that you find meaningful. And this isn't subject to the views of others. It is a Kantian conception of uh, a dignity, which treats individuals uh, as having equal worth in and of themselves and not to be used as pawns in the service of others. So I want to talk about two more rights, very briefly, if I may, um, and then lead with my conclusion. And that is the right to security and control over one's body. The right derives from the capacity it protects, the capacity to express one's own character, values, commitments, convictions, uh, and critical as well as experimental interest in the life one leads. Recognizing an individual's right of autonomy makes self-creation possible. It allows each of us to be responsible for shaping our lives according to our own coherent or even incoherent, but in any case, distinctive personality. It allows us to lead our own lives rather than to be led along them. So that each of us can be, to the extent of a scheme of rights, make it possible what we have made of ourselves. We allow someone to choose death over radical amputation or blood transfusion if that is what his or her informed wish is, because we acknowledge his right to a life structured by his own values. Now, these sentiments aren't just my own or, or that of Professor Ronald Dworkin. They find application in our constitutional jurisprudence as well. Our courts have consistently recognized that individuals are free to make decisions about themselves and their lives, sometimes even where it is to their detriment, as was recognized in the case of Barkhazen versus Napier. So the right to freedom and security of the person contains a number of distinctive applications in our constitution, including physical freedom, that is restraints from state intervention, the right to be free from cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, and the right to bodily and psychological integrity. I'm going to speak about this last right uh, very briefly. I'm not for a second going to suggest that there are no legitimate interests of the state. There are legitimate interests of the state which it is required to advance. Justice Wallace recognized at paragraph 72 of his judgment that we have diverging views as the public on this, uh, on this matter, that, that there are numerous cultural and religious differences, and that, problem, and that we have problems of an overburdened healthcare system. But I want to express a few thoughts on this. The first is that Chief Justice Chaskelson warned us in the Treatment Action Campaign, a case in which the government claimed that it did not have the capacity to provide antiretroviral treatment to those with HIV and AIDS, that the unavailability of resources is never a reason for government inaction. The state is required to do something rather than nothing in realizing <coughs> rights. The reality is that a complete prohibition on assisted suicide has no coherent justification. I'll just need about three more minutes or so. The law is disproportionate to its aims. And in the vicious net, in this vicious net of state prohibition lies the vulnerable who wish to end their life with dignity. Proportionality requires some measure of reasoned action. The state has done nothing to ameliorate the violations that accompany forcing individuals to live. It has no law, it has no policy, and it has no program. 
Everyday assisted dying occurs without state regulation and very often without dignity. The Constitution tells us that this is unlawful and the state is required to take positive steps to respect and protect the rights violated by our common law. So may the state reasonably limit the right to life, dignity, equality, and freedom of security of the person? The answer is no, and it is no for a very simple reason. Because the Constitution requires that for, before any right may be limited, it has to be a law of general application that is compatible with the values of freedom, equality, and dignity in an open and democratic society. This is the first leg of the limitations test. But the first leg cannot be satisfied. How can a blanket prohibition be compatible with freedom? It is repugnant to freedom over one's body and to make choices, seated in section 12.2 of the Constitution, the freedom to make decisions about your bodily and psychological integrity. How can it be justified based on the value of dignity? It affronts dignity at every turn. And how can it be justified on the value of equality? It allows able-bodied, the able-bodied to end their life and those who are not to suffer. So it fails on the very first test of the limitations analysis. If there was a clearer case for failing the leg of the limitations clause, it would be the case on the prohibition on assisted dying. There is no legitimate interest of the state under the second leg either. And this is because the nature of the rights infringed formed the foundation of our constitutional order. Because the nature of rights infringed uh, are core to our constitution uh, as it stands. The aims of the state are not achieved in any event under the current legal order. So there's no legitimate aim which the state pursues. In fact, the prohibition acts as a wide net that is disproportionate to its aims. And the effect of this disproportionate impact is indignity, pain, suffering, and needless harm. I want to leave you with one final thought, and it relates to who better is suited to decide the issue of assisted dying, parliament or our courts. And this is the big problem that lawyers would have to address. And so I use the words of Justice Albi Sachs in S versus Makwanyane to guide us. He tells us, the idealism that we uphold in this judgment, the judgment on the death penalty, is to be found not in the minds of judges, but in the explicit text of the Constitution itself and the values it enshrines. I have no doubt that even if, as the President's judgment suggests, the framers subjectly intended to keep the issue open for determination by this court, they effectively closed the door by the language that they used and the values that they inquire, require us to uphold. It is difficult to see how they could have done otherwise. In a founding document dealing with fundamental rights, you either authorize those rights or you do not. In my view, the values expressed by Section 9 are conclusive of this matter. These rights, ladies and gentlemen, are not subject to majority vote. They either exist or they do not exist, and the state either continues to violate them or they allow their citizens the dignity of determining the time and manner of their death. Thank you.